So to start this afternoon, every Tuesday and Thursday, Stuart George likes to get somebody in to have a little bit of a chat during the first part of the show. Uh, opportunity for you to call in too if there's something you want to ask our guest. And today, talking about photography, not your high-end fancy technical photography, just the point and click kind of stuff. The stuff where you can still get fantastic results, especially nowadays. Everybody's got a camera, haven't they? Uh, Neil McIntosh is in the studio today. He's from Stafford. His photographs have got him noticed. Is that fair to say, Neil? Um, yes, I think you could say that. Mm, for mm. what reason? <laughs> I have no idea whatsoever, to be perfectly honest. Uh, it's it's one of these stories that has a weird beginning, and I don't know whether it has an ending. I've got no idea at all. Okay. what? When did you start taking photos? Right. Well, it all started from about three and a half years ago. I was living over in San Sebastian in the Basque Country in the north of Spain. Um, came Quite back picturesque. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. A very nice part of the world. And had to come back here for personal reasons and start again in the UK, if you like. Living at my parents' house, I was at my wit's end one afternoon, bored out of my mind, and ended up borrowing my mother's camera and going off down the, to, the, to the local canal started snapping away at just about anything I could find. And when I got back home, I found a couple of the shots were quite reasonable of a couple of birds that I'd seen and decided, well, maybe I could do something along those lines. Started going out a little bit more with her camera, taking a few more photos and sharing them on Facebook as probably virtually everybody does. You know, look at me, I've done this. Got a load of people liking the photos, but of course they're friends, so no disrespect to my friends, I love them dearly, but you can't quite say that, you know... <laughs> they always say they're great. Yeah, of course they well, I Actually, I've got some friends who would tell you the truth, to be fair. So. <laughs> I've, I've got one or two of those <laughs> as well, don't worry. Um, well, from that... that Towards the end of last year, I put up what I considered to be my 12 favourite shots of the year and got a bit of a response from that, somebody asking me, why don't you make a calendar? So I thought, well, do I or don't I? Because I wasn't happy with the quality. And in the end, I said, yes, I made a calendar. Ended up selling 45 calendars in the space of three weeks without pushing it. In the meantime, I'd been in contact with a guy called uh, John Turner, thanks to uh, Martin Adams there, by the way, uh, at the Staffordshire Wildlife Trust, and said, you know, I'm taking photos on staff's land. Would you be interested in the photos? And he said, yes, of course I would. So I started sending him the photos, and he was sharing them on their Twitter account and their Facebook account as well on a regular basis. From there, this is where he gets interesting. Um, I ended up receiving an email from him saying that the Express and Star in Wolverhampton, the, the Midlands paper, were interested in using one of my photos on the front page. So I said, great, you know, give them my details. Got a phone call about five minutes later from uh, from a gentleman there, Carl, Carl Jackson, who said, listen, it's a stag photo, we want to use it. How about it? I said, great, no problem at all. And got talking with him, told him about the calendars, and he was like, oh, well, in which case, we'll do a full article on you as well. From that was where BBC Radio Stoke got in contact at the beginning of January and invited me to do a 10-minute slot um, in the morning, on the morning show, yeah. at about quarter to nine, which I did from the Stafford studio remotely. It seemed to go down quite well. In the meantime as well, I'd entered the, one of the first proper photos that I took into a national competition in the Mail on Sunday, and it was of three fallow bucks standing in a wheat field, side by side looking straight at me. Composition's great. The quality is, I wouldn't say it's dreadful, but it's not its not that good. It's not the sort of magazine publishable quality. And that I didn't hear anything about until January as well. And whilst I wasn't selected as one of the winners of the categories, I was one of about half a dozen highly commended photos that they still wanted to use and published on their national website. And here I am now sitting Same. like five months later talking to you for a while longer. And I'm <laughs> supposed to be back in September even longer still. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. It also is great. Um, and this is something that you just picked up as anybody could. Yeah. Uh, this is not so. training. It, there's nothing technical about it. You thought, you know what? I've got a camera. I'm going to spend some yep. time. Um, what makes a great photo? If you could sum it up in almost three steps, what makes a great photo? It's the patience to look around and see what there is focusing on one particular how can i put it one particular area of the land if you like and see what's in there just keep your eyes open that's all it boils down to and eventually your eye will become trained to what there is 
that you could consider normally you consider to be in the background but it's actually there in the foreground but you just don't notice it is that the mistake that a lot of people make that the the subject that they think is the is the one everybody interested in actually isn't and if you just train your eye a little bit differently you can find quirky things and- i think that is i think that's correct um i'm finding that again i was talking with this martin adams um about this last week and we, everybody is so concerned with getting the absolute perfect shot in the highest resolution possible of a beautiful bird sitting in the tree with the feathers nicely positioned when nature isn't like that nature's far more um far more random and if you look at some of the shots that i've taken you'll see things there you think do they really do that but if you stop and actually watch it's exactly what they do exactly. day after day yeah. And it's, that's what I like doing, is showing the side of nature that everybody considers to be different, but is actually normal. Okay, I'll tell you what we'll do. Uh, we'll, we'll open it up. The, the phone number is 01782 208 if, if you are the kind of person who thinks, do you know what, my photos are dreadful. And I, I, you know, I have to put myself in that particular you know, okay. area. So we'll talk about that. 01782 208 There's anything really photograph-related, photography-related that you would ask, ask Neil? Uh, he's with me in the studio. Your call's appreciated. We'll talk photographs this afternoon. Then.
BBC Radio Stoke. That'll be Diana Ross, Ain't No Mountain High Enough, quarter past four with Stuart Ellis. If you are a fan of a good double entendre or a man with a slightly camp voice saying, ooh, matron, no, uh, then you'll be pleased to know that the Carry On films could be making a comeback. I'll bring you the details on that around about ten minutes' time. Also, we're talking photography this afternoon. Neil McIntosh is with me. If there's anything you'd like to ask him about your photographic skills, 01782 208 008. Uh, in the news this evening, a public inquiry has been told protecting Jodrell Bank from over 100 planned new homes is a matter of global significance. The International Olympic Committee says 31 athletes have tested positive for doping following the reanalysis of samples from the Beijing Olympics eight years ago. And in sport this afternoon, Stoke City Chairman Peter Coates says he hopes defender Andy Wilkinson continues in the game in some capacity. So go on then, a cold caller calls you... What do you say? What I decided to do was, what somebody were trying to sell, I'd say, I don't want you to do it. I do that myself for a living. <laughs> Morgan in the morning. Have you ever been caught out with that? Well, yes, really. The company wrong asking about fitting kitchens. No, not really, I said. That's what I do for a living. He said, you do it for a living? Well, we shot the fitters in the crew area. Do you want a job? <laughs> <laughs> Hoisted by your own petard, Gordon. <laughs> Morgan in the morning on BBC Radio Stoke. Weekdays from seven. So Stuart Ellis here for Stuart George. And with me is Neil McIntosh uh, from Stafford. Photographs that have got him noticed, as we said. Something that you picked up just due to boredom, really. Uh, picked up your mum's camera. Uh, what kind of camera was it? Um, it was a Panasonic something or other. I couldn't tell you which model it was. I wasn't saying anything really, really old with an old film that needed developing. No, it wasn't no, that no, no, no. The, my my father has uh, has those sort of cameras still uh, stored away in the loft because yeah. he was certainly a very, very good photographer when uh, when he used to go out and about doing it. And that's the big difference, isn't it? If we look back a generation. Um, we didn't take photos because you you needed to take a camera on holiday with you that was a big bulky thing. Uh, even so, okay, there were the Instamatic Polaroid ones, weren't they? But yep. but other than that, it was putting a film in it, yep. which needed developing in Boots or Timothy White. So yep. if you wanted to do it seriously like you do, you'd need a darkroom. Yep. Um, all these things, and I suppose with only so many frames of film on a film. You had to be careful what you took a picture of, but now you'd have to wow. you'd have to have been very, very, very patient indeed, and waiting God knows how long just to get that one shot from the right moment. Whereas these days, and it's something I do myself, uh, you can set the camera to rapid fires, like for example, eleven frames a second, and you can snap away at something as much as you like. And uh, the card that I use in there has the capacity for around about two and a half thousand photos which in those days you're talking 100 rolls of film, which would have cost you a fortune. And, and you'd have to go and, and get them developed before you even realised if you got the shot you wanted. Exactly. But with, with the chance to take 2,000 on that camera then, do you sometimes just take a load of rubbish and, and you're less disciplined? Does it work the other way as well? It, it started like that. It was a case of just pointing and shooting and snapping at just about anything that moved or didn't move yeah. <clears throat> and seeing what came out. Whereas, again, I think because of the fact I've been, I'm one of those who's lucky with the hours of work that I do. It enables me to go out around about four days a week in the morning and the afternoon and take the photo. So I've become a little bit more disciplined with regards to what I look at and what I photograph. OK. Um, Sue's been on in Braidley. She would like to know, how does using the flash in daylight help your pictures? Or does it? Using the flash in daylight. Like yes, if you're, from what I understand, and I'd, apologies for this, Sue, I'm not a technical photographer, um, this is more, as I say, wildlife-based, but if you have a subject that is backlit, i.e. the sun is behind them or there's a very bright light behind that person, when you focus in on what you're trying to photograph, they're naturally going to come out very, very dark because the camera is trying to compensate for the light behind. If you use the flash, it will also then light up the subject that you're trying to photograph as well as having the light behind it. And is that why you, if you see TV filming or films being done during the day, even if it's broad daylight, they have lights, don't they? They, they, they do that. And that's yep. that's to balance it out. That's right, So it's yes. as simple as that. So it can actually help then to use the flash during daylight. It can do, yeah. Which is something I would never have thought of doing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Interesting one. 01782208008. If there's anything you would like to ask Neil this afternoon, if your photography skills are as good as mine, I would say, how do you stop them looking all blurry and looking like you were drunk when you took them? Uh, we'll get a check on the roads. Here's Lucia.
It's still slow around Bassford on the Etruria Road, the A53 northbound from the Gladstone Street Junction towards the A500D Road. Now, there was a breakdown just on the roundabout a bit earlier. That's gone, but it's still really busy around there. Handchurch, Stone Road A34, heading south towards the A500D Road. That's also looking very busy. And Utoxeter's A50 starting to slow now as well around the Ashbourne Road at the Little Chef roundabout. Heading out onto the motorways, northbound M6, a queue there because of an earlier breakdown between 18 at Middlewich and 19 at Nutsford. Now, it's causing a bit of a delay towards Junction 17 at Sandbach. There's also roadworks around there adding to those delays. If you see a problem, call us at 01782 208 008. Keeping Staffordshire and Cheshire on the move. Travel news every 20 minutes. BBC Radio Stoke. I'm talking photography with Neil McIntosh this afternoon. Um, one of the other things, of course, that's changed, we're saying the cameras themselves have changed, and the fact that the size of them, and, and they're incorporated into an everyday device. Like now, it's, it's on your phone. That's yeah. where my camera is. I don't own a, a separate camera. Yeah. The, there is a big difference, though, from what I understand. Um, there, there's like a, a mini computer inside your, your phone, as there is inside the camera. Now, inside the phone, the mini computer is dedicated to everything that the phone is doing. Whereas within the camera, it's just dedicated to the camera. And also within the cameras and also the phones, there's a sensor which it, it helps to um, improve the quality of the photos. Now, there's only so much that the information that one of these sensors can hold within a phone. Therefore, the quality of a camera phone is not as good as a digital camera Actually these buying days. Actually, yeah. even it's, a basic digit camera, digital yeah. camera, probably a step up if you wanted to do it It seriously. would probably be on a, on a par with a good camera phone. Yeah. But if you want to go a little bit further, then a, a, proper, a proper digital camera really is it's what you need. Okay, question coming in here. This says, uh, how do you get good wildlife pictures if you don't have a powerful zoom lens? If you're not going to invest thousands in these lenses, because they are expensive, aren't mm-hmm. they? How do you get a good life, wildlife life pictures you don't necessarily need to have a good uh, zoom lens depending on the subject matter that you're taking uh, the, the majority of the work that i do is photos or of birds insects butterflies there are some deer shots it's more than anything a case of patience and waiting you can't go looking for nature nature has to come and find you so go and sit yourself in the middle of a field somewhere or on, on the edge of a field in the middle of a forest and sit and wait, and eventually something will come close. And if you're still and quiet and don't frighten it, and you settle, eventually, as you say, they'll come to you. Exactly. And you don't need to zoom. Because the, the, the zoom, on, on certainly on camera phones and things, is pretty poor, isn't it? They can be very grainy if you actually do zoom in. It is, and it's the same with this particular camera that I've got. The, the zoom on it is very, very good, and it's a very cheap camera. But if I, if I wanted to go for professional long-range shots, then yes, I'd need to get a far better camera and, and a, a very good lens to go with it. But... The if people want to have a look at the shots that I've taken so far, they can see that they're they're not of a bad quality. Let's put it that way, and that's not a not an expensive camera. Okay, where, where's because where, you've got a Facebook page and, and things and things. So is that where the best place to look for your photography? Yes, that's right. It's uh, the, the Facebook page is called Argaski Mac A R G A Z K I. Second word is Mac Argas Argaski is a Basque word meaning photos. And that's probably where you got your inspiration because you were over there in the beautiful parts of Spain. Indeed, <laughs> that's it. And, and I, the other thing now, of course, is it, what we used to do is we would take photographs and then they sit in a drawer. Mm. And maybe people had, you'd bore people at a party or something, but yeah. that was it. But now people's photos are there forever and they're instantly there as well, which sometimes people can regret. But yeah. uh, the access to photos, it's become it's been so, become a part of daily life now, photography, hasn't it? Very much so. Um, again, especially with regards to social media, because there are so many people are posting photos of just about everything on social media, which is no bad thing because it's it's got me to where I am now. Um but again, the accessibility, you've got to be very careful with things like copyright, because if you've got some very good photos that you want to use, anybody can pinch them off the internet if you haven't put a, a watermark of some sort mm. on them. So you've got to be very, very careful with regards to that as well. Yeah, your photos, once they're out there, is very difficult to take them down, as yes. some people have found to their cost. Yes. Uh, Rob on the text says, here's a good tip, see what you think of this one now. Mm. He says, uh, take a long exposure at night and use a torch to paint light on your photo. He says, it's very impressive. I'll have to think of that one. You've not tried that Thanks one? Thanks very much, Rob. No, I haven't. Oh, oh, okay. That's an interesting one. We'll, we, we'll add that to the list of tips then. Um, Definitely. Have you, have you tried? Are you very experimental or are you pretty much uh, you know, a basic kind of photographer? I'm basic and with the occasional experiment coming through. <laughs> you, don't, you don't go for the abstract then? No, 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 no. no. I'm, I'm, I'm old school traditional. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so we can see, as you say, um, your, the, some examples of your work on the Facebook page. What about uh, t- taking it further for you? I mean, it's, is it something that you still consider to be fun hobby rather than actually I'd quite like to take this as a profession? It's, it's a fun hobby that may become a little professional, but it's not something I'd leave my daytime job to do because... If I really wanted to make a career out of it, I'd need to sell a heck of a lot of photos um, and get myself hooked up with some really good equipment and with some really good magazines and really push for it. Now, I'm doing it for the love of it. And if I make a little bit of money out of it, that's fine. I mean, what I've sold so far is paid for the camera, which I'm more than happy with. Which you want to do. But for you, it is all about wildlife and and going out into nature rather than, I'm going to start doing weddings. Very much so, (laughs) very much so. I mean, with regards to weddings, I can't stand and tell people what to do and how how to pose themselves. That's not me. Um, I'm doing this the main reason I started doing this was out of boredom but the real reason now is to actually show people what there is out there because I've already had quite a few people that I know who've seen the photos and said I've never seen that before or I never knew they did that and if somebody comes out and says that and spends another five minutes of their lives standing still and watching what's going on I'm a happy man fantastic I'll tell you what time for one more question Mike has been on in fence he says can you use a camera phone to take microscope pictures to be perfectly honest, I don't know, Mike. The only thing I can suggest is have a go have and a see go what happens. And see what turns yep. out. And see what it's like. no, never going to do that again. Yeah. Could I say hello to a couple of people? Of course you can, yeah. Lovely, thanks very much. Well, firstly, I'd like to say hi to mum and dad. Thanks very much for everything. The guys and the at, camera. Of course, yes, <laughs> yeah. The guys at .com, uh, look forward to seeing you on Thursday and see what your opinion's been. To anybody down in Essex that knows me, my friends and uh, relations everywhere else, and especially to um, LFPB over in in Ireland, four, da- four weeks, five days and counting. Oh, OK. So they're listening. lots of people listening online then down in Essex. Today, There's a few as far as I know, yes. <laughs> Great to talk to you, Neil. And you will be back. You're going to be back later in the year on BBC Radio Stoke. Yeah? Apparently, yes. I'm back in <laughs> September for an hour. <laughs> Look forward to it. Thank you, Neil. If you